Gravity, always keeping you down. But why? Well, as we all know, it's because of the curvature of space-time by the uneven distribution of mass in the universe. Thanks, Einstein. Okay, but when most people think of gravity, they think of Isaac Newton, who believed that all matter attracted all other matter, and because of this, the more massive an object, the stronger its attraction, defining this force mathematically and creating his universal law of gravitation. Though a lot of people don't realize that Johannes Kepler actually suggested the idea that bodies have mutual attraction almost 80 years earlier, and Newton was actually just trying to explain how this worked. It didn't actually pop into his head one day fully formed when an apple fell on it. Nonetheless, it leads one to wonder. We often say that Newton discovered gravity, and well, that is partially true, but still, it's not like people were just floating around in the air before Newton published his Principia, or even before Kepler published his Astronomia Nova. So then, how did people understand gravity before this? To clarify, in this video, I'm going to focus on Western thought. Other societies around the world have had their own ways of conceptualizing and understanding gravity, but those are outside of my area of expertise. So, in order to understand how pre-modern people understood gravity, we have to go back to 6th century BC Ionia, where the Greek philosopher Anaximander was contemplating the nature of the universe. Anaximander believed that the universe was composed of a chaotic mass called Arche, but that qualities inherent in this Arche separated it into spheres. These qualities existed as opposites, hot and cold, wet and dry, light and dark, etc., which caused matter containing them to move in opposite directions. Therefore, cold things, like water and earth, moved down towards the center of the sphere, and hot things, like air and fire, moved up. Anaximander therefore developed the concept, which would hold sway for millennia, that what would later by Empedocles be called the four elements, each had their own spheres, one inside the other. Earth was at the center, surrounded by water, then by air, and then by fire. This is idealized, of course, because, for example, the lands upon which humans lived were protrusions of Earth through the hydrosphere, and Anaximander saw movements back and forth between the spheres as bringing balance to this system. If you're wondering what's up with fire being at the top, this is because people at the time understood the sun, the stars, the moon, basically everything in the heavens, as being made of fire, and also noticed how flames always moved upward which seemed to indicate that it was naturally moving up, trying to be above the air, much like a rock falls and sinks even below the water. Later on, Empedocles would argue that these four things were elements, the stuff from which everything else was made, and it was thanks to him that this idea became widespread. For Empedocles, however, the force which brought things together and separated them were philia, love, and nikos, hate. Though we shouldn't necessarily think of these as actual emotions so much as terms he used to represent the concepts of attraction and repulsion. It was because earthly things, quote-unquote, loved the center of the universe, therefore, that they moved towards it. The concept of the four elements and their spheres was also picked up by the two most influential philosophers of ancient Greece, and some might argue in all of history, Plato and Aristotle. For Plato, the natural movement of the elements was due to their makeup. Wanting to have a mathematical basis for all existence, he argued that the four elements were each of a specific shape. Earth was a cube, water an icosahedron, air an octahedron, and fire a tetrahedron, or triangle-based pyramid. Or, for the fans of tabletop games, a d6, d20, d8, and d4, respectively. The lightness or heaviness of each shape was related to how many scaling triangles each shape could be broken down into, with water being more heavy and cumbersome, and fire being lighter and sharper, more fine. Earth being a cube was made up of isosceles triangles, not scaling, and was the most dull and sluggish in Plato's view, which is why it sank to the bottom and was hardest to move. But Plato's view on the matter would be far less influential than that of his student, Aristotle. In fact, Many people for centuries have attributed the whole idea of the elemental spheres to him. One of his biggest contributions was to claim that only the world beneath the moon, the lunar sphere, was made up of the four elements, which were corruptible, that is, changeable, and whose natural movement was linear, up and down. 
The moon and everything beyond, that is, the heavens, was made up of something called ether, which was perfect and whose natural motion was circular, which is why the heavens rotated around the earth. As for that linear movement of the elements, Aristotle also canonized the idea that the four of them each had two qualities from the opposite pairs of hot or cold and wet or dry. Earth being cold and dry, water cold and wet, air hot and wet, and fire hot and dry. Once again, as with Anaximander, the cold elements had an inherent quality of heaviness, which caused their natural linear motion to be down towards the center of the universe, while the hot elements had an internal lightness, which made their natural motion to be upwards, towards the extremities of the sublunar sphere. Water, although heavy, was less so than earth, which is why its natural place was above it, and air less than fire. Again, Aristotle recognized that this was the ideal positioning, and that all sorts of unnatural motion displaced the elements, and certain impediments prevented them from settling in their proper places. But one could see all over that as soon as those impediments were lifted, the elements continued their natural motion until they reached their natural place in their own sphere. Stones thrown in the air fell down to the earth and sank beneath the water. Bubbles rose through the water to the surface. Springs of water emerged from the earth to create rivers, and the fire inside of wood rose up towards the sky when it was finally released. Even earthquakes were seen by Aristotle as violent eruptions of air escaping the ground. And since these elements made up everything, the proportion of each within something is what determined its weight or lightness, and how strongly it tended towards the center. The huge influence of Aristotle would guarantee that this concept of the elements, their qualities, and their natural motions would be the main way of understanding things like gravity for almost 2,000 years. This concept would be taken up by Claudius Ptolemy in his Almagest, the most influential work on astronomy until the 1600s, and was carried on into the Middle Ages. The elements and their spheres are discussed in all the big medieval encyclopedias, from Isidore of Seville's Etymologiae to Bede's De Natura Rerum to Bartolomeo's Anglicus's De Proprietatibus Rerum. And although there were some variations here and there, often due to earlier medieval authors being acquainted with the concept but not directly with Aristotle, the translations of his and Ptolemy's works into Latin in the 12th and 13th centuries once again reinforced the centrality of these views. This isn't to say that there was no criticism of Aristotle, but most critics were more concerned with the mathematics of motion. Aristotle believed that continuous action had to work against an object for it to move in an unnatural direction. But the Persian scholar Ibn Sina, for example, whose works would strongly influence medieval Europe once they were translated into Latin, pointed out in his Book of Healing that a stone thrown into the air doesn't just immediately start to fall as soon as it leaves your hand. It had what we would today call momentum. Others also critiqued the fact that Aristotle didn't have a concept of friction or acceleration. But for the most part, they all still followed the idea that elements had either lightness or heaviness as internal qualities, and that heavy things naturally tended towards the center. In his 13th century commentary on Aristotle's Physica, for example, the Dominican theologian Thomas Aquinas wrote that, Some ask why heavy and light things are moved in their proper places. The reason for this is that they have a natural aptitude for such places. For to be light is to have an aptitude for that which is up, and the nature of the heavy is to have an aptitude for that which is down. Hence, to ask why a heavy thing is moved downwards is nothing other than to ask why it is heavy. The same thing which makes it heavy also makes it to be moved downward. This quotation also shows that people took for granted that heavy things moved down. This seems to have been enough for most people, and it likely would have been too obvious to even think about for many. Though Ptolemy specified that down is subjective, and is whatever direction points towards the center of the sphere of the universe, depending on where you are relative to it. And that's also why the Earth itself is a sphere. And yes, in case you weren't aware, people at the time did believe the Earth was round. I've made a whole video about that too. They also believed, as I've glossed over several times by now, that the Earth was at the center of the universe. And so they didn't have to explain why things moved towards the Earth's center, because this was understood to be the center. Now, there were also alternatives to the Aristotelian understanding. The Stoics, for example, believed in a universal pneuma, meaning breath or spirit, which was influenced by Aristotle's ether, but which they believed was a mix of air and fire. 
And rather than the elements having a natural tendency toward the center, it was the pneuma which existed in the heavens, which held all of the other elements together and pushed them down, since it was the source of all life and, significantly, motion. Without the pneuma, all matter would dissipate into the void. This view wouldn't be nearly as influential as Aristotle's, at least until the modern period when some scientists and philosophers would propose similar mechanical theories of gravitation and movement. René Descartes, for example, proposed that ether physically pushed the planets through the heavens, like stones through water currents. But Descartes was writing at a time when the Aristotelian view was falling apart. Like I said, the idea that heavy objects just tended naturally towards the center relied upon the idea both that the Earth was the ultimate center, and that the heavenly bodies were not made up of the same stuff as the Earth. This became harder to maintain, however, after Nicholas Copernicus proposed a model in which the Earth and other planets revolved around the Sun, rather than everything revolving around the Earth. Copernicus's model would take time to catch on, but for those, like Johannes Kepler, who supported it, they could no longer take for granted that all things moved toward a single center, and this is what led him to propose that all matter was attracted to all other matter, and therefore the larger the mass, the more strongly other objects are attracted to it. But larger objects, like the sun, are also attracted to the smaller, just much less. And once Isaac Newton was able to mathematically explain and prove this idea, the way we understood gravity changed forever. Gravity was still seen as an invisible force, but it was no longer an abstract intrinsic quality of heaviness or lightness. It was directly tied to mass and density, and attraction was present in everything. Even air was attracted to the earth, it was just more buoyant. People would still try and figure out why this happened though. Newton said that he had little interest in hypothesizing what he couldn't determine through inductive reasoning, but others would propose all sorts of theories. As of now, our best understanding comes from Einstein's theory of general relativity. But if you want to know more about that, there are plenty of excellent channels on YouTube which are far more qualified to talk about that sort of thing than I am. Though there are also plenty of channels full of clickbait and misinformation, so, you know, think critically. Either way, I hope you found this video interesting. As always, I thank you all very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.